I guess I kind of wanted to start out. You're going to hear a story where it seems like I've been called and like I was pursuing God since a young age, but I just want to like kind of put a disclaimer that I was not like a good child. <laughs> um, I think it gives good God glory because I was like, in at least in elementary school, like if you saw me, you'd be like, oh my goodness. <laughs> So to be that kid who was like exposed to all these bad things and who did all these bad things, for God to have like pulled on my heart and called me out, that gives him so much, like it shows how much he loves me. And I just want to give him the glory for that. So <laughs> thank you. I just wanted to with that. <laughs> Thank you. So I was, I thank God for this because my parents, even though like I was a bad kid, they still took me to church. So that like, I guess throughout the years of listening to sermons, especially when um, I started middle school, the way my mom raised me was to be the best. So if I got a 98, she would ask what was the highest score in the class. And if I said another kid got 100, she would be like, oh, next time, make sure you're that kid. Make sure you get 100 next time and like walk away. <laughs> So that made me kind of want to become better than other people in a way. So I thought, okay, I go to church. I'm a Christian. I think I need more. I need to become better. So I was like, let me read my Bible. So then I started reading my Bible, and I was like, no, I need to get even more ahead. So let me find people who've had experiences, like spiritual experiences, because then at least when I die, I can't, I'm not just a regular Christian who's like, I just went to church. I can be like, kind of get on God's good side. So this was also mixed in with the fact that my parents were physically present, but mostly emotionally, like, weren't like, emotionally didn't comfort me, I guess, in a way. So I was also looking for somebody to love me. So in a way, people were like, oh, God loves you. So I was like, if he's gonna love me, let me go towards him. And then on top of that, let me go more above average. So maybe he'll love me more. So I went on a journey where, you know, you, you go on YouTube and you just look up like spiritual experiences. So I just started watching a whole bunch of those. And then I was led to um, Divine Revelations, which is like a website where people just put up their testimonies of like spiritual experiences. So I went through a whole bunch of those and I told myself, I said, I'm just gonna go down the page. I'm just gonna go one by one and read them all. And I think the Baptizing by Holy Fire book was like the second one. And so I like read the synopsis and I was, um, I said, hmm, this is interesting, but I was busy that day. So I was like, let me just skip this one. <laughs> and just keep going down the list. So I, I read so many, there was once where I like wore skirts for the whole year because the lady told me I was going to hell for wearing pants. So, <laughs> so I stopped wearing pants. And then my mom, it was that time when the colorful pants were in style, like the early 2010s. And she bought me like a couple of those. She was like, you're gonna wear pants. And I was like, I'm gonna go to hell because this woman's making me wear pants. <laughs> and then there's one where I like, I guess it was kind of like the fast where I stopped watching like movies and stuff because they scared me. They were like, if you watch too many worldly things, you're going to hell. So I was like, okay, bet. So I stopped and then I made my sister and she always comes back when I ask her about how we grew. She's like, I remember that time you told me I couldn't watch cartoons because you were too much. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then there's another where I did the Sabbath from sundown to sunset and I wouldn't cook. I was, it was a lot. <laughs> but I was like, I think at first it's like you want to, you're searching for that. So you're passionate. And I was also that kid at school who I started being like, you need to follow Jesus. You need to do all this. So I was that kid who was like hounding other kids. And then um, eventually it like fell off after a couple of years. And I remember I started acting like the other regular kids. And one kid came up to me and was like, weren't you the person who was telling us about God? Like, why are you acting like the other kids? And that hit me. That hit me so hard. I think even now I try to be like show my actions because rather than just like hound other people about God, because you don't know if your mess up is gonna stumble somebody, you know? So I hope that um, I try to show my actions rather than just like being overly preachy to people, at least outsiders or worldly people. So then eventually I, f I went back, I guess, to the top and was like, let me give this book a chance. So when I saw Pastor Kim, I thought he was a woman named Kim. So <laughs> I was like, it's a woman. 
was like, okay, I'll, I'm gonna read it, that's fine. And then I, I read it and then I was like, wow, this is really nice. So I went on YouTube and I was like, let me go look up like how these people look. And that's when I found out he was a man. And, <laughs> and it was the revival for, in Canada and I think they were speaking French or something. And I watched that one. And then uh, uh, Miss King was giving out like tongues and I was watching it and I got my tongues while watching it. So I was super excited. I think I prayed two hours that night. Thank goodness my sister was like a deep sleeper because I was going. But um, <laughs> so I was super happy. And then, and then I think the, the Holy Fire books has like a website which you can like make an account and talk to other people. And I saw Pastor Steve was like an admin. And then I found him on Facebook and I texted him again because my mom, I was like, they're making me go out to eat on Sundays and spend money. I need help. I'm gonna go to hell. <laughs> And he was like, just listen to your parents for now, and then when you grow up, you can move here. And then I was like, okay. So then ever since then, I was like, okay, I'm gonna move here. I'm gonna come to California. So I've been telling my parents since I was in middle school, at like 14, that I'm coming. And I don't think they took me serious until this year when I came, so. <laughs> um, and then there was this one time where my mom found me praying. So I was praying on the floor, like on my knees in my room at night, because that's when I prayed. And she turned on the lights and I'm like, oh my goodness, the Lord has given me a spiritual experience. <laughs> I was like, he's going to open my eyes. And, then <laughs> and she sat there, she watched me for a good couple of minutes, which I felt was so rude. And then she was like, what are you doing? And I was like, oh. I don't, I don't know, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and then, you know, she's African, so she's like, are you a witch? What are you doing? Are you trying to fly? Are you a witch? <laughs> and I was like, no, no, I'm not a witch. I'm just praying. <laughs> so, um, so that was one of my experiences. After then, I was like, I was more sl slick, I guess. I tried to pray when she wasn't home. I prayed like less. And every time we moved houses, I took the room that was furthest away from her room. So that way she couldn't hear me. And then also I kind of like pulled back at school because I didn't want to form relationships that would hold me back from coming. So I made sure to be nice and cordial, but I didn't want to like make best friends, you know, cause they'll hold you back. They'll be like, why are you moving? We like you, you know? So um, in high school, I graduated after three years and they're like, aren't you gonna have a senior experience? I was like, no, bye. <laughs> I was like, I have a place to be, I gotta go. So, um, and that's, like I said, I told my parents that I was moving and they didn't leave me, but look where I am now. So, and then I had been watching, like, I think I found the YouTube channel for this church, because after I spoke to Pastor Steve, then I was set on this church. I was like, I'm gonna move to the San Francisco church. So, um, I had been watching, I'd seen so much, like I saw when the rap team was first beginning, when they were like missing their lines and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I would see them. I saw Deacon Junior to get his versus wedding. Like, I think we dressed up too. We were like watching legit. Like we were like, ah, they're getting married. <laughs> so it's like, I saw people's testimonies. I saw when new people came. So when I came to my first revival and the way I got to my first revivals, I wrote a whole paper about how I had a school trip. I, I put the, um, I put the hotel, I made up, like I looked up companies in this area and I, I wrote a whole itinerary and I told my parents, I said, I got selected for this trip <laughs> at school <laughs> to go see all these companies. And you know, for her, she was really happy. She was like, my kid got selected. And I was like, mm-hmm. <laughs> so that's how I did it. And that's when I first, I came for my first revival. And I remember seeing everyone in real life. I was so shocked. Like I saw senior elder Janine, and I was like, whoa, that's her in real life. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and I was like seeing everyone like, wow. And then, um, so then the first time I think was the hardest to convince my parents. But then after that, they were like, okay, you know, she, she, she's getting selected for these trips. So the second revival was like, okay, okay, that's fine. You know, I didn't really have to like write a whole paper. And then, <laughs> And then the first summer I came, I told my parents that I got an internship because my cousin had done internships. So I was like, okay, that's a way I can like find 
to come. And I wrote another paper for that one. I wrote like the companies, I found companies around here. I said, I'm gonna visit these companies. I'm gonna stay at this place. And she's like, how are you gonna get your groceries? I said, they're gonna give me an Uber. I'm gonna go to the store. I'm gonna get my groceries. <laughs> so I, I, I made like a whole thing. And she was like, okay. And then I told her I was going with a group of students. So she dropped me off at like the airport. And I'm like, oh, ha -ha, they must have checked in already. I'm kind of late. <laughs> Let me go check in and go find them. And she's like, okay, see you. And I'm like, yeah. So, um, and then when I came, <laughs> she was like, send me a picture of your room. And I was like in the living room. So I had to like angle the camera towards the wall. So she didn't see like the curtain that was like <laughs> blocking my section. So, and she was like, oh, that's nice. The picture's kind of dark. And I'm like, oh, I'm too busy. I can't retake it. So, <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so then when I first came then, it wasn't too stressful because I was like, I was just, I was happy I was finally here. And then I got the Chick-fil-A job and I was grateful because in Indiana, the minimum wage is still $7. So to get $20 at Chick-fil-A, I was, you know, I was so grateful. Um, and uh, it was so great. And I learned a lot there. And then when I got back, I learned that my mom was like looking for a new place and in a way, it's like God led us to get a house. So I always think like, oh, when I got back, like God blessed us with like a really nice house. So I was super thankful. And then um, jump to my second visit. I didn't really write a paper for this one. I was just like, I got another internship. Um, so I got a real internship and it was based out of New Jersey, but I came here anyway. I just told her it was based here. So, <laughs> so I would like wake up at like 4 a.m. because it's eight o'clock in the morning in New Jersey and like, 5 a.m. here when I would have to start. So I'd wake up at like 4 a.m. and thank goodness they didn't have like the rule to have the cameras on. I just had my blanket like <laughs> and, and attending the morning meetings. But um, that internship was also nice. And the way I got that one was I didn't even expect it. I think I had prayed. I was like, Lord, please get me an internship so I can go to California in the summer. And I'm not gonna lie. I was like, I was thinking like, if I don't get one, I don't know if I should come. But then they randomly called me and they were like, we had two people and the other person was perfect. They knew everything, but we chose you because we realized that you would be the one to benefit the most because that other person can get anywhere. And I was like, that was God because anybody would have hired the perfect candidate. Why are you gonna hire somebody who doesn't know anything, you know? So, um, and then when I came, I was like, oh my goodness, everyone's so friendly. Cause like, I didn't really make like friend friends. So when we would hang out, I was like, oh, so this is how it feels, you know, <laughs> to all be hanging out. <laughs> And then, and then when I got back from that one, I told Pastor, I was like, I'm going to buy an escape. And I'm going to drive here. I'm going to escape in my escape. So, <laughs> in a Ford escape. And then I was, like, looking for the car. And then my mom was like, hmm, why are you looking for a car? You can just, like, take mine as, like, your graduation present. And I was like, wait a minute, what? And she was like, yeah, just, uh, I have, like, 2000 left on it. If you just want to pay, pay it off, you can have it. And I was like, oh, I was like, okay, I guess God wants me to have that car. But at first I was like, but the gas, but the, you know, the, the thing needs to fix it. I don't know. I may want a basic, you know, Ford. <laughs> but I was like, it's fine. It's fine. If God wants me to have it, I'll have it. And then um, after graduation, I like knew my time had come. And I think pastor texted me and he was like, um, he was like, are you coming and like, tell me the dates. And I was like, okay. And then I texted my boss, and I was like, I can't let my, my brain know what my hand is doing. So I texted her, and I just, like, clicked the I'm leaving thing, and I was like, oh. <laughs> and then, because I knew I'm the type who has to, I just have to do it. I can't think. You, you just got to go. So um, so I just, I quit. And then I was like, okay, since there's no job, I'm, I'm leaving. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then uh, like, literally the month after my graduation, my dad went to the hospital, and he's... Uh, because he had a headache and they gave him like a CT scan and he had a brain tumor. And um, this was thankfully after like I had been telling people so nobody could like fault me. But um, I kind of knew, I was like, you know, I can stay here and because you know, he's sick. So that's what people kind of expect. They want you to stay with your sick parents. But I was like, no, I told God I'm leaving and at least here I can, you know, maybe pray for him. And I just felt like he would get worse if I stayed. So in a way, that kind of pushed me because every time I was like wavering, I was like, no, he's sick. And I, I really feel like God needs me here. At least here I can pray for him. 
And um, I think that was like a motivating factor. And then about a week before I came, pastor was like, okay, you're gonna live with Deaconess Marissa and your rent is like a thousand. And where I'm from, a thousand is gonna get you a luxury condo with like all the amenities. So, <laughs> so I looked at it and I said, oh my gosh. But I said, if God wants me here, I, I'm gonna make that a thousand. <laughs> Even, you know, it's a room. But I told my mom, I said, it's 500 because I didn't, I didn't have time for somebody to fight me. <laughs> and she still, she still thinks it's 500. And she'll stay thinking it's 500. So, <laughs> but I knew, I was like, God will take care of me because in the end, even if I got that, you know, amount, I'm going to be able to cover it. So then when I came, I was, of course, I was scared because this was my first time um, leaving home. Like, I'm moving out for the first time. And also, I was like trying iffy, and I was like, but I've been thinking of coming here for so long. How can I, you know, be doubting? So um, I just kept going with it because I was like, to ship my car was already so much. And then, like, I had already bought all this furniture, so I'm thinking logistically, there is no going back, you know? <laughs> so, um, uh, but then it's like the first month went along, and Pastor would be like, so how's the job going? So how's the job going? And I knew, you know, it's like sometimes you want to be like, where's pastor? So you can be like, hide. <laughs> but, but I was like, no. And then I'd be like, oh, there's nothing. There's nothing. And then, and then after a while, I started getting stressed. I was like, oh, no, rent is due. I don't have anything. And I only saved up like a couple thousand. And, then, you know, I have all this furniture to buy and all this stuff to do. So um, I eventually started getting like night terrors. So I'd wake up in the middle of the night just stressed, just like sweating, like just, <gasps> you know. And then... Um, and then I, some t I borrowed some money from my mom, unbeknownst to her, but that's fine. It's getting paid back. <laughs> but the thing is, I was scared to ask because I didn't want her to tell me, like, hey, see, this is what happens. You shouldn't have, you know, gone. And um, so everything, every week, Pastor would be like, did you get a job? And then he would give me advice, like, go get a California license. Maybe you're not showing up in the system. So then that week, I would make it my, you know, like my thing to go do. Because in my head, I'm thinking, he knows, you know, he can, he's here to help me, so let me listen to him. And then, um, and then he also asked, like, people like Crystal to, like, tell me how they, um, how they got, like, their resumes. Because he was like, maybe it's your resume. So then Crystal really helped me with the resume. And then I went on Fiverr, and that helped me with my resume. So I was just listening to him and taking his guidance and also listening to the people. Because I knew something at least was going to get, you know, something good was going to happen. And then... Um, I still got rejected everywhere. So, <laughs> and the pastor was like, God wants something from you. And at first I was like, I don't know what he wants because like, I'm here. Like, I don't, I don't know. So, um, so then he was like, maybe God wants you to like trust him more. And I was like, okay. So I was like praying. And then there was what um, Elder uh, Sam called Black Deliverance Night where... <laughs> Or pastor, uh, I think he saw it on my face. I was stressed that day. So he was like, come, let's go pray for you. And I, I don't know, I have some funky demons, I guess. They just like to do stuff when they're getting prayed over. So, um, <laughs> so literally, I'm like over here and I'm screaming. I'm stomping my feet. And I'm like, no, no. And in my head, I'm thinking, am I really doing this? But, <laughs> but it's happening anyway, you know? So... Um, so then after that night, I felt amazing, you know, I felt freed. I was like going home, I was t calling my sister like, you do not know what I just did, funkiness, but I am free. So, um, so I called my mom and then she was like, how's the job hunt going? And, and then I was like, it's, I don't know, there's nothing really happening. Uh, Cause I had told her that like I had a specific recruiter. So I was like, I have a recruiter, I'm guaranteed, you're good. Like, so she's like, how's your recruiter? I had no recruiter, but she's like, how's your recruiter? And I was like, she's good. Thank you. And then, um, <laughs> and then she was like, maybe just get like a low, like a regular job just so that your bank account isn't stagnant and just like losing money because that's what was happening. And then pastor that next week was like, why don't you just go work with Elder Daniel and go like um, clean the banks? And I was like, okay. Because <laughs> in my head, I'm thinking, I mean, it, it, a job is a job. So, Okay. Um, and then I'm also thinking maybe God like wants to teach me something from this job and also um, uh, Or show me something so I'm thinking maybe this is a way he's gonna like expose what he wants from me And also I'm gonna listen to pastor so to see um, Because in a way me listening to him is still is putting me in the right direction or priming me for whatever God has for me so um, 
I got the bank job. I was, it, it wasn't, I wasn't necessarily like, woo, but I was like, you know what? <laughs> I was like, is this the way you're gonna use God? Um, okay. Uh, so I went and um, uh, I, was, I was like, okay, hopefully whatever you want from me is exposed at this job. But the job exposed a lot of like feelings I had in me. And I'm the type of person where I don't wanna like, I know there's people, like, we can, when we're sad, we can still say, like, oh, I'm happy, just, like, speak happiness over ourselves. But I was like, God, I'm going to tell you straight. I'm not going to hide. <laughs> this, is, this is how I feel. <laughs> so I was like, God, Pastor Steve is telling me to trust you, but this situation makes me not want to trust you. So please change my heart so I can trust you because I know your plans for me are good. Help me believe that your plans for me are good. And then... Um, I was like, because, like I told you, my mom was very like, you have to be the best. Your grades, like, every time I got a B, it was like a failure. So in high school, I had failed, like, a chem chemistry class. I had gotten, like, a C. And I remember that broke me. Because for me, I took my, I thought my worth was in my grades. So when I failed, it was like a midlife, well, not midlife, early life crisis. <laughs> early life crisis. <laughs> So I was like, God, this reminds me of that time when I failed. And I, in, in my head, I was like, it feels like you dropped me and I like just shattered because that's all I based my worth on. And um, so then I was like, but I know my worth is in you and not in like anything else. It's not in my grades and it's not in the job I have. So, and then on top of that, the job was like with rent and with all the bills and I was rejected for unemployment. I was rejected for CalFresh. Like my paychecks were like, barely meeting it. Like I had like $50 left at the end when you factor in everything. So then I'm, um, but I was like, you know what? If God put me here, I'm, I'm gonna make it. I'm gonna make it. That's not the issue. But it was just the stress of just like, I felt like I was always in like fight or flight mode all the time. But I would come and I would be like, hi. They'd be like, how was your week? I'd be like, great. <laughs> <laughs> but deep down I'd go home and I'd just like, <sighs> And then I think one Sunday, pastor was like, hmm, God wants something from you, Nangi. And I remember driving home, and it's like white knuckles on the steering wheel. And I'm just like, oh, what do you want from me, God? Please just tell me at this point. I was like, treat me like Helen Keller 3000. Can't see, can't hear. Like, that's how the grace I need, as if I'm, you know, Helen Keller times 3000. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's what I prayed. And then on top of that, um, I guess this also my mom taught me was when you do work, it reflects you. So you have to do it good because in the end, it's going to reflect like you as well as the company. So while I'm cleaning the banks, I'm like seeing things and I want to clean it well because I, first of all, I don't want somebody to say I can't clean because I can clean. But, um, <laughs> and then also I was like, you know, this is Elder Daniel's job is from God. So let me do it well and even maybe like go and do the extra little nitpicky things so that way you know, it'll make me feel better and make me sleep at night knowing that I did my best. So, um, and also because I wasn't at the church, since I was like a virtual member, I didn't have pastor to hold me accountable when I said I was going to do stuff. I mostly went straight to God. I would pray like, Lord, I don't have somebody to necessarily like tell me like, oh, you didn't do it or you did it. I'm going to like, you know me and I know you're going to hold me accountable. So I did the job, too, knowing that God was watching and God is going to hold me accountable. And I think that's the way I am mostly with many things that I say. And you'll see this, like, come back when I was praying for the position. And then um, what also shocked me was there was times where I just wanted to go back home. Times where I was like, mm, how would the logistics work? Maybe I could, like, go back, work for a little bit, have enough money and bring my car back. And then I was like, but you've been wanting to come here for 14 years. How can you, you know, want to go back? And that's when I realized I'm here by God's grace. I'm not here just because I've been here since I was like 14, 15. I'm here because of God's grace. Because there was days where I was like, I need your grace, God. Because it's like so quick where I could just leave because I was so stressed. And um, that really let, that put that in my heart that literally I'm not here by my own volition. It is all God. And then I think this also led me to... Um, to have to address my emotions. Because we were doing the fast where you couldn't like watch anything worldly, so I couldn't like dr like forget about my feelings by watching a happy show. And then I couldn't just eat either, so I couldn't eat my emotions. So it's like I just had to like deal with them at the time that they were there. 
So that helped me in that I learned to like accept them but not let them control me. And I think that really helped. And then also I realized I had a negative self-perception of myself that I put onto God. So I thought that, you know, I'm, I was very hard on myself. So if I failed, it's like you're just dumb and you're just stupid. And then I just thought God is probably just looking at me like, mm, look at her. Like, I can't believe this. But then it like, for some reason, I just got the revelation. Like, you're projecting that negative self-perception that you have of yourself onto God. And um, after I realized that, I was like, you know what? I'm not going to speak negatively or down on myself because God doesn't see me that way. And then when the thoughts would come, I would be like, well, even if I'm insufficient, God is sufficient. So it doesn't matter. And then uh, Pastor texted me with Denise about like a lab position that had opened up at her work. And I was super excited. And I was like, oh, maybe this is it. And then they rejected me because I was overqualified. So then I was like, what? First, I'm not qualified. And now I'm overqualified. <laughs> And then I think that's the time I signed up for the Kaiser position because I was like, you know what, let me just sign up for something I am qualified or at least could qualify. So, because um, she, she, it was like, mm, you know. <laughs> and then my mom was like, that's crazy. And I was like, I know. So then I kept applying for other jobs and I think there was one week where I applied to so many jobs and I did so much and I texted the pastor this huge paragraph of everything I did that week. And he was like, oh my goodness. He was like, you need to just flow. And I was like, I was like, ah, Lord, help me learn to flow because I don't want to flow. I'm in that like, that type of state where it's like, I just want to do, 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 do. And he's like, flow. So I was like, Lord, please give me the grace to flow. And then I, th I think I felt better. Like God's grace was so much at that time where I felt like most of the stuff, even the rejections, especially the ones that hurt. If I prayed like, Lord, please give me the grace. He would give me the grace and I would like feel better. And um, it's also what, like, enforced that, uh, that lesson that you can't do this on your own. This is all God. And then um, I just prayed for, like, a different job, not necessarily, like, a good job. But I was just like, Lord, can you give me a job where I can make kind of enough, where it's, like, every new opportunity, I'm not so desperate for it. And then Dignus Mercer was like, my boss is um, hiring an RBT uh, person. And I was, at first I was like, no, because back in Indiana, I had worked with autistic adults and they had scarred me because they, because adults, children, you can kind of like maneuver and manipulate. If they try to hit you, it's like, move, you know? <laughs> adults, it's like, you don't duck, it's gone. <laughs> so so, um, so I was kind of like PTSD'd, but then I was like, you know what, maybe this is God opening up a door for me, so let me just like take it. So I was like, okay, you know what? I was vacuuming one of the banks one night and I was like, what am I gonna lose? So I was like, okay, Dignus Marissa, can I, you know, can you tell your boss about me? So I dumbed down my resume because I was not about to be overqualified again. So I took off all the stuff <laughs> and I put like my past job in Indiana with the autistic adults as like the main work that I had. And um and then at the same time, I had uh, applied for like a construction project manager thing. And I felt like the interview went well and they rejected me. So I was like, oh, well, you know, like I felt like that really was going to work out. So, um, so then uh, Deaconess Mercer's boss interviewed me and then she gave me the job. And by then I was like, I'm tired. And I had spoken to my mom on one of the last days at the bank and she had explained to me how like God was taking care of my family. She was just explaining like what was going on and I could tell that they were like taken care of. I think that was also a stress for me is wondering how they were doing. So when I saw that, it was like God telling me like, you see, I'm taking care of your family. The reason you are not able to rest and you are not content is because you're choosing to stay stressed and like to stay not trusting. So that's when I got that revelation and I said, okay, you know what, God? Um, with the job I'm getting now, I'm going to rest. I'm going to just settle down and I'm going to just live my life and pursue what you want me to do. So then at the interview, she was like, oh, this is a new company. So I know you have a degree. If you need, if there's like a position that opens up or something you see that needs a need, you can like switch roles. So I'm thinking, oh, maybe God is going to use this. Maybe they need like something in IT or tech or something, which I could eventually become. Um, <clears throat> so... But then I was thinking to myself, like, this RBT job is good, but it doesn't really have, like, benefits because I, like, I twisted my knee in, like, middle school, and it's never been fixed because I don't have health care. So I was like, but I need benefits. This knee needs to get fixed. But I was like, but thank you, God, for, you know, this job. And then, um, so, 
like I said, I was the enemy against, like, my mom never told me, come back home. She never said you made the wrong decision. Most of the time, she actually, like, agreed with pastor, which made me, I was like, I want you to want me back. Why? You know, I am your first fruits. I am your child. Why don't you want me? <laughs> and she was like, you can come visit and go back. I was like, oh, go back? You're not even going to be like, stay. Like, <laughs> so, um... And then while I'm working with the kids, I randomly, like, I was just sitting on my bed, and then I see this uh, call from someone named Gina. So I'm like, oh, this is spam. I was like, I need a little spice in my life. Let me answer this and see who this is. So, <laughs> so I, like, answered it. And, you know, you answer spam, and you're just like, hello. And she's like, hi, this is Gina from Kaiser. And I perked up. I said, oh, hello, Gina from Kaiser. <laughs> So she's like, do you want to, um, there's a position because the last person wanted it to be like remote and they're not, they live too far so they can't come. So you're like the next person. So uh, are you, do you want this job? And I was like, of course. And then she like set up the interview. And like after that call, I texted Deaconess Marissa. I was like, you would not believe what just happened. <laughs> and then, um, so that week I was like super excited, but I was like, oh no, I'm excited because my emotions, like, I don't know. I guess my parents didn't like me having too many emotions. So I'm, I'm, I hide them, and I, I guess I kind of feel bad sometimes when I have too many emotions. So I was like, you know what, you can have your emotions as long as you don't let them control you. So I was like, okay, I'm going to be excited for this opportunity, and I'm not going to beat myself up over it because I'm excited. So I was like, I have joyful expectancy because either way, something good can happen from this. Either, you know, God is showing me, teaching me a lesson if I get, like, rejected and I don't get it, or I get a good job. So either way, something, you know, Good is going to come from this. And then I had like quiet confidence that if this was the job God had for me, I was going to get it and not necessarily from what I could do, but because he had given it to me. So then the interview came and like I, I, um, I started like the day before is when I wrote my notes because I had jacked up my resume, not too terribly, but enough to get people's attention. <laughs> But I needed to be able to back up that experience that I said I had. So I went and I made sure to like look at the list of stuff I said I knew and research it on YouTube really quickly so that if I got like basic questions, I at least could answer those. So, <laughs> but it wasn't too bad. It was just like adding an extra year because like I didn't have a year. I just graduated college. Most of my stuff was like three months. So I just said a year because uh, whatever, you know. So... <laughs> So the interview was rough, and it wasn't rough because I couldn't answer the questions. I could. It's just that I felt like it was a team of, like, older people, and they had been on that team together for, like, 15 years, and I'm, like, the new person, and I'm young. So I was struggling to see if they were actually taking me serious, and I felt like the questions they were asking were more of, like, what is project management? Instead of, like, asking stuff about the job, they are asking, like, for comprehension, like, as if I, like, do you know what you're doing? So, um... I answered those to like my, the best of my knowledge, and I thought I answered them well. And then towards the end, he was like, do you have any more questions? And I was like, <laughs> I was like, we're over time. I'm going to value your time. And then they were like, okay, thank you, bye. And in my head, I was like, thank goodness that is over. <laughs> but then I was like, I prayed about it. I said, you know what, Lord, it's okay, because I know if this is a job for me, even though I felt like the interview didn't go so hot, I'm going to get this job. And then I prayed. I was like, Loki, if you could take out the other candidates, that would be great. I'm not saying kill them. But if you can find ways for them to not be able to have this job so that I am the leftover person, that would be amazing. So, um, and then the next day, I think I had, like, a huge test. Okay, so I'm going to just preface this. You see me, like, when I come, like, like especially on Sundays, I try. I try to look nice. Um, so... I'm going to, because I'm just starting, so I have to shadow people. So I'm shadowing Joshua on that Tuesday. And, <laughs> and, and, and I don't know, I was thinking I was just tired, so I just, like, I just put on like a little scarf. And, and then he likes to play ball with one of his kids. And so like, they always like when he like, throw, throws the ball really high. So like, of course, he's taller than me. And in my, in my excuse, I think his hands are longer, so he can make it go higher than me. So... You know, the kids really like when he does it. And then he was like, look at you, you can't even throw the ball that high. And then, you know, and so I'm, at first I was like, oh, that's nice. <laughs> but by the end of it, I was like, ugh. So I was like, I'm going to use physics. Because, you know, as a volleyball person, it's like the force, if you throw the ball, then you hit it up. 
it's like all that force goes up so the ball can at least go high because what he does is he throws it on the ground and then it shoots up. I was like, I'm not wasting that energy. I'm just going to hit the ball while it's still in the air. So, <laughs> so, um, so I was super excited. So I, I got ready, you know. I'm like, the ball is in the air. I hit it. And, oh, man, I'm going to have to show you what happened. But um, so I'm like, and I feel my hair slide all the way off. And I feel the wind in my scalp. And, <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, like, I should not be feeling the wind in my scalp. And, <laughs> and, and the kids are just like, and then, <laughs> and then Joshua's like, I'm not looking, but he's looking while he's saying, I'm not looking. So he's like, I'm not looking, I'm not. And I look down and my hair is on the ground. And, and I thought it was a joke. I was like, I know this is not happening to me right now. <laughs> and, and you know Joshua. He, like, he uses humor in situations. So it's like, and I didn't know what to do. I just picked it up. I put it back on. I just put it back on. And then I went to the, I said, give me a moment. So I ran to the back of one of the cars in the driveway. And I was like, let me fix it. So then I fixed it, and then I come back, and we still had 15 minutes, and I'm like, dang. And this man is about to make comments. And of course, he's like, dang, I didn't know you had them prison braids. Because <laughs> I had my hair braided underneath. And then, and then just comments after comments for 15 minutes, and I'm just sitting there like, mm-hmm, that's nice. <laughs> And then by the end, I was like, please don't tell anyone. He goes, I'm going to tell this person and that person. And then I was like, I'm literally going to shank you in the dark. Because if it was light, I wouldn't catch you because you'd probably run. So in the dark, I'm going to plan. And he goes, just like you planned for your wig not to fall off, and it did. <laughs> and I was just like, oh. And I was thinking to myself, like, I would rather have gone to the food court at the mall and taken it off there then have it fall off in front of Joshua because <laughs> I can't run from him. I'm gonna see him every weekend and I'm gonna hear about it every weekend. And then I had to like go to him again like the day after. So I'm thinking to myself, man, I can't run from this man. Why, you know? So I go home, I tell my sister and she's laughing. She's having a great time hearing about my demise. And then I tell Dignitas Marissa and she's rolling too. So then I'm thinking to myself like, I can be like angry about the situation or I can be negative or I can just use this as an opportunity to bond with people at my expense. But at least I can strengthen relationships with others. So then I was like, but I was scared because I had to see him again on Friday. So I was like, oh a whole nother hour with him, and he's probably gonna keep talking about it. And like the first thing he said when I sat down was just like, oh, how are you? How's the hair today? <laughs> and I was like, oh. Uh, and then, um, but yeah, so I chose, I was like, you know, I'm not gonna hold it against him. I'm not gonna like be mad. Cause I was like, I'm thinking, I was like, this might be God trying to humble me because I know it sounds funny, but this is like my worst nightmare. This is stuff of nightmares for me, at least. So just like imagine like something you would hide or an insecurity and it happening in front of somebody who you know is not gonna leave you alone and somebody you're gonna have to see <laughs> all the time. So, um, so I was like, you know what, God, I prayed. I was like, God, it's okay. Maybe I'm just a prideful person and you needed to humble me. That's okay. I said, I'm just, I'm just going to submit and I'm going to be humble. And when he makes his comments, I'm just going to take it. So he would make his comments and I would just be like, ah, oh, that's nice. Thank you. And then, um, <laughs> so then I kept going. And then, uh, then I guess that weekend before I got my, my notice that I got the job, during the Minnesota revival, Pastor Kim told us to pray for finances. So I was like, okay, I'll be shameless. I was like, Lord, low key, you know, if I get this job, I can help your people. On top of that, Bishop Kim told me to pray. So Bishop Kim told me to ask you for finances. So let me ask you for finances shamelessly. So then, um, and then I told my mom about the Kaiser interview and she was like, oh, maybe you like, you chose too high of a company and maybe it's too much of a role for you. And I was like, no, it's okay. But if God wants me to get there, then um, I'll get there. And then she was like, okay, pray hard. Make sure you pray really hard to get the job. So again, that Sunday I sat right there and I was like, God, my mom told me to pray really hard. So I'm gonna pray really hard for this position. And I was like, if you give me this job, I want to use it to help your people because in the end, um, 
you could use me like to help the church or to help people during revivals. And um, even Pastor, when he had asked for the Zells, I was thinking in my heart, I was like, dang, I don't really have anything to give him because, you know, right now it's like I'm making so much. And I was like, I wish I had more. And then, um, so then I was, but then I was like, you know what, let me continue and go deeper. So I was like, okay, this is, because I had read that the salary for the position was between 70 to like 100K. So I was like, Lord, if you give me 70K, I'm grateful. If you give me 80, I'm going to get excited. If you give me 90, I, I don't know what, I, I won't be able to believe it. I was like, if you give me 100K, I'm going to be speechless. So <laughs> I was just like, I was just talking and I was just like, okay, Lord, please. And then the next morning while I'm at work, I got a text and she was like, hello, this is Jessica. I just want to let you know you're the finalist. And I was like, oh. so I texted <laughs> Deaconess Marissa and I was like, oh my goodness. And then I called my family and, and then my mom was like, wait, what? She goes, I told you to pray hard. I told you if God wanted you to get this job, you're going to get it. And I was like, oh, thank you. And we were just all celebrating and so happy because it's like all the calls leading up to this, she was always just like, hey, what's happening? And it was always just like, uh, nothing really. Sometimes I would even say I had an interview when I had no interview just to pacify her. So um, it was like crazy to see it like finally come. And then um, when I called the lady, so she's like, hello, this is Jessica. I'm the like onboarding lady. I'm just here to show you your benefits and tell you all of that. So I'm just super excited. I'm just in like the lobby because uh, my clients live in an apartment. So I'm just walking around and pacing. And then she's like, okay, this is what you're going to get. Your offer is 97500 with a 5% bonus. I said, woo! <laughs> so I was like, I wanted to cry, but I was at work. So I was like, oh, I'm told it in. And so I texted Deaconess Marissa because she's a person I really text a lot. Sometimes I'm like, I really do text her too much. But anyway, <laughs> it's like I need somebody. So... Um, so I was like, I was so shocked. I said, oh my goodness, God. But then when I had prayed over there, I also told him, I said, God, you know my heart and you know how much I can handle. So you give me what you think I can handle because um, I want you to choose for me because you know, like, you know my heart more than anyone. So then um, everyone was super excited. And then when I calculated with the bonus, it's actually 102. So I guess I'm speechless. Because, <laughs> so God answered. And then, um, I guess the lessons I learned was just submitting to authority, even when you don't really know. Because for me, at the banks, I was just like, oh, okay. But I was just thinking, like, this is God's plan because pastor's telling me to do it. So I just submitted. And like I said, um, I, I guess because I'm young, maybe, or just because, I don't know. But I know that I need help. I'm here. I consider church to be almost like a hospital. So... If, like, your doctor tells you to do something, at least if you want to get healed, you're going to do it. So that's what I feel like pastor is. like when he, And also multiple times he's said stuff that has, like, he, like, had, it's like he didn't, I didn't tell him and he just knew. So it's like sometimes, <laughs> so when he talks, I'm just like, okay, okay. And then um, I guess I'm just starting to learn that I'm God's servant, especially when we were writing the declarations where it's like, I'm going to go wherever you tell me to and I'm going to do whatever you tell me to do. At first that freaked me out. That freaked me out because I was like, then that's like, because words are so strong and that scares me so much because I'm like, then God's going to test it. And God's like, if you're serious, God's going to come and be like, hey, you told me you're going to do whatever I told you to do and you're going to go wherever I told you to do. So I was like, but pastor said, so I have to say it anyway. But I was like, at first it was like a struggle just saying it. I was like, oh, and then I would be like, but Lord, please give me grace <laughs> and help me to be able to do it. And then um, I also realized, like I said, I can't do a single thing without God's grace. Um, because even if I had been watching, even since middle school, when I came, I still had my doubts. And that really did show me that time really doesn't, it's, it doesn't matter how long you've been here, you can still fall away. Because the reason we're still in these seats is because God gives us grace to be able to overcome and to um, be able to like, uh, not necessarily give in to our offenses or like give in to, you know, our flesh. So that really showed me. And then um, he also gave me a lot of grace during the hard times at the bank. And even now, I just wanted to say, because I realize this, like school necessarily doesn't open the doors because you saw me for three months. The doors were not opening. So I tell people who are like, oh, I'm going to go to school and suddenly I'm going to make all this money. It's, it's not the degree. It's God. Because if it doesn't matter. Yeah. So um, I, and I, it's like that lesson has really been ingrained to me because I had to say it so many times. And then... Um, I guess what it also taught me was while I'm at the banks, I'm trying to see what God wants for me. I'm trying to like recalculate like a GPS just to see because you never know which path he's going to take with you. So I would just say to be open. 
And then I just wanted to say God loves all of us because I prayed specifically for this job and for the amount that I got for his people. So he gave it to me for his people. So that shows just how much God loves all of us and how um, he's willing to just like use other people to bless others. Thank you. And then <laughs> Can you go ahead and read the scripture you have up? Oh, yeah. One moment. And then, sorry, I had a couple of scriptures. And it was like, how can a young person live a clean life? By carefully reading the map of your word. I'm single-minded in pursuit of you. You don't let me miss the road signs you posted. I've banked your promises in the vault of my heart, so I won't send myself bankrupt. Be blessed, God. Train me in your ways of wise living. I'll transfer to you. To my lips, all the counsel that comes from your mouth. I delight far more in what you tell me about living than in gathering a pile of riches. I ponder every morsel of wisdom from you. I attentively watch how you've done it. I relish everything you've told me of life, and I won't forget a word of it. And this really resonated with me because I realized that when I put God first, especially the job hunt, when I gave up and was just like, you know what, God, you can figure it out, that's when I got my call from Kaiser. So I was... This one really resonated with me just to realize that pursue God and all the other things will come. And then I had another one, which was um, Isaiah 41. Okay. So, but you, Israel, are my servant. You're Jacob, my first choice, descendants of my good friend Abraham. I pulled you in from all over the world, called you in from every dark corner of the earth, telling you you're my servant, serving on my side. I've picked you. I haven't dropped you. Don't panic, I'm with you. There's no need to fear, for I'm your God. I'll give you strength, I'll help you, I'll hold you steady, keep a firm grip on you. So for me, that one really resonated, because like I said, in high school, when I had that experience, I felt like he dropped me. So it's like I was hesitant to trust. So um, seeing that he says, I haven't dropped you, made me realize that he was there, and he's always been there, even in the hard times. In the end, it was all for his glory. And also just the fact that he said he pulled you from all the corners of the earth, just knowing that, you know, you're chosen out of all these people just made me, humbled me so much and made me feel so grateful. So thank you. <laughs> all right. Wow. Amen. So um, before we go to prayer, let me just, sit. let me just uh, comment a little bit and then we'll go to prayer since I know some of you have just been sitting there a long time. Well, I, I just want to fill some gap uh, on her testimony. Nengi uh, started following our church when she was 14 years old, okay? Are you listening, teenagers? Um, she's 23 now, okay? She's 23. She comes from Indiana, right? <clears throat> Indiana. And at the age of 14, she has been following our church and, and the fire ministry, and she's been watching the sermons, you know, and this was her church even at that age. And she didn't have, you know, the, the youth support as some of the youth have right now. She was by herself over there, but she kept committed. Now, I want you to uh, discern why she got this $100,000 a year job. With benefits, it goes over 100000 of course. So she, you know, working at Kaiser, she gets full Medical coverage and retirement 401 and all that. Amen? She just, call, she just finished college, right? This, and, uh, more or less, this is an entry-level job for her. She did, you know, she, what she put on her resume, she does know. And, but at the age of 23, coming out of college, God has blessed her with this, you know, really good job. And for the youth who are going to college... You need to understand this is why one of the reasons we send, we're telling you guys to go to college. Some of us had not go to, gone to college, but it does help, right? It does help and you, if you learn a higher level skill, that is even better because you're going to contribute it to the kingdom of God. Amen? Why couldn't she find a job in three months? It, God has his reasons and God is working in our heart, but at the same time, there is this Kaiser job that God had planned, but she has to wait this three and a half months. She's only been here three and a half months, she says, right? I, it feels like she's been here longer, but she's, she's only been here three and a half months. She was struggling, looking for a job, but yet God did have this job ready. But it's going to cost her three and a half months 
But a lot of times when God has something good for you, you don't know that it's there, right? You just want it now. And because you don't get it now, you think something's wrong. And then we start, you know, you start, you know, falling apart. But in the meantime, while she's waiting, you know, she has to fill in the gap. So I tell her, go work for Elder Daniel, go clean banks. So now you have to know she's an IT graduate, okay? She's an IT or computer science graduate, right? And, and now I'm telling her to go wash clean desks, dust floors for, uh, what, what is it, 20 bucks? 20 bucks an hour, right? So it, was, you know, it pays rent at least. And then I said, go to RBT, you know, dealing with autistic kids. Um, and Joshua Mata was training her. And she has a computer science degree. And now she's told, go and deal with little autistic kids, right? And think about this. How would other people react if your pastor says, hey, go clean the banks and dust the floors and vacuum when you have a bachelor's degree or okay, let's try to get you more money as an RBT, $25 an hour, right? Uh, go, go and deal with, and you know, I didn't know she had a problem with adult autistic people, trauma issue, so, but God wants her to clear that out, right? But you have to understand the whole storyline, okay, of her life. From the age of 14, she already made a commitment to choose God even over her family, even over her place of residence, over there of comfort, right? She had chosen God. She kept, she shows a timeline of I'm going to put you, I'm putting you, you first, God. You have to understand this, okay? I'm putting you first, God, okay? She, she could stay in Indiana, feel safe. Now then a test comes right before she's about to go, right? Because we always talk about this. Now her dad is sick, tumor. If, it can feel like she's abandoning her family, She's now faced with a choice because God is saying, choose me or choose your family. She chose God. Because, and she got the revelation because her posture in her direction is towards God. I got to choose God. If I go, they'll get better. If I stay, he'll get worse. Physically, it looks the opposite. Spiritually, you got to go. She chose God. Do you understand this? She chose God. Now she comes here. It's not, it, it, it's not, um, it's not happening right away. Right? And pastor's like, you're paying $1,000 for a small room. You can bring your bird. Now, like she said, Indiana, 1000 bucks. You probably got three three-bedroom house all to yourself. I paid her first month rent, and, I, and she has some savings. So I said, use your savings. And she's having a hard time finding a job. Maybe in her mind, did I make the right choice? You know, and, and I'm sure the emotions of maybe I should go back to Egypt is, you know, twirling in her mind. Maybe even her bird is saying, let's go back home. You have a parrot, right? Parrot's like, let's go back home. Maybe, who knows? So she's tested, but you have to understand, okay, you need to understand this. It only took three months, not three years, not five years. She kept making the right decision. I'm going to trust you, God. You have something good for me. I'm going to trust you. Even though it looks like she's being pushed lower, right? Bank job, RBT job. But I got a degree. Just do it. And she's, I trust God. And then after the interview, she has this big test, right? Her hair, her wig falls off. Her worst nightmare, her deepest insecurity exposed to Joshua Mata. Her number one nemesis. On top of that, with a bunch of six-year-olds, kids with autistic, autism. Let's play with the hair. <laughs> they may be chasing after the hair. We, she didn't tell us that part. Instead of falling into resentment, anger, embarrassment, she chose in that moment I'm going to let it go. And this is what we preach to you all the time. Let it go. Let it go. And some of you don't let it go. She chose to let it go. And she let it go. Call comes. You got the job. You know why she got the $100,000 job at the age of 23? The level of maturity is shown when she let it go. 
you will get, you will do better in life, and you will get paid more, and you will experience the blessings of God, whether it's financial, whether it's spiritual, when you show that you are mature enough to receive it. Her prayer is, God, let the salary be, let the salary reflect what what I'm able to qualify for. And so God is saying, you're worth a hundred thousand in spiritual maturity. You, you are that mature. You can handle that. You've now shown me through the last 10 years of your life and even this last few days, what you went through, that you are mature and I'm going to bless you accordingly. And she got blessed. Amen? You have to understand this. It's not just following my instructions along the line, but there is a bigger context behind that, right? There's a bigger background of information behind that. So when you ask God and you go, why are they blessed and I'm not? You look at yourself. Don't complain to God and don't complain about other people. You look at yourself. You can be 40, you can be 50, you can be 60, and you can be spiritually immature still. And, and your life reflects that. Your, where, your status reflects that. And, and we'll have a 23-year-old sitting here in church. That will show a much higher level of maturity that's been given a lot more responsibility spiritually, physically, given authority over people as well, given leadership as well, right? If you're going to be assigned a level of leadership, think. And if you're not assigned any leadership, think as well. Why am I not assigned leadership? Am I immature? And even if you are assigned leadership, don't think you're just automatically mature. Because you could be given the assignment first to show your maturity. Otherwise, you will lose ground. Amen? So I want you to, you know, that was a fun testimony. And I didn't know she was so lively and bubbly. <laughs> and we have a lot of characters coming from, uh, we're going to have a lot of people coming from all over the world. We're going to have families coming here. And they're all going to have testimony. They're going to come with problems too, of course. And, and I'm very uh, pleased to hear from Nengi that, when she first got here, the experience was good, that people were nice to her. We were welcoming her as a family. And, you know, she's been watching us from video for 10 years, basically, right, from the age of 14. And she's like, when she met us, like, wow, I finally get to meet them, wow. That's it. <laughs> I'm sure she didn't say that, but, but that, was, that was good. Okay, good, good testimony by Elder Ellen, too. Uh, you guys need to listen, okay? When we, when, when we preach up here and when we bring other people, they're bringing a different angle. The ingredients is the same. The gr ingredients are all the same. We're just using different, we're using the ingredients of the food and different measure, different angle to give you a different meal so you can get the same benefit though, right? You're getting the same nutri nutrients because one person may like one type of food and maybe not like another. So one angle, you may be able to more digest better. One angle, you know, it doesn't hit you yet. So God uses these different angles and different people and different testimonies and uh, change up, you know, the program and to keep us continually motivated and, and growing. Amen? You are all called to grow, change. You're not called to be static or stagnant, that is, you're losing ground. You are called to grow. Do not think that you're just going to plant yourself somewhere and this is safe, this is where I'm just, don't touch me, don't talk to me, just leave me alone. I'll come to church, I'll make my tithes and offering, don't ask me to do anything, pastor. No, you know what, it's not me. God's going to shake your tree, okay? God's going to shake your tree and the storm's going to come and God's going to see if you're, if you've, fall. And when you fall, don't come crying because you would have got enough warnings that your roots are weak, not deep enough. So you have to have the posture and the mental mindset, right? And the attitude. I'm like a soldier's. You're ready to go, ready to be deployed. When the answer comes, you are ready to go to work for God. Not like, don't call me God, don't call me. You know, and then, well, you're going to be on 
spiritual minimum wage then. Or you can be on top of the food chain. We are the children of God. We're not supposed to be bottom feeders. You know, catfish? You find something tasty down there? <laughs> top of the food chain as children of God, right? They're supposed to come to us. Okay, we hear your God answers prayer. Can you pray for rain for our country? Can you help pray and, and, and something good can come out? See, we're supposed to be the answer to the world. Not the, oh, don't go to those Christians, bunch of hypocrites. They're a bunch of hypocrites. Who are you? Are you a hypocrite? Or are you God's child that walks like Jesus Christ? That does what he did and do. Remember we talked about being a sodomite yesterday, right? You know what a sodomite is, right? Sodomite. Ezekiel. The sins of Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Sodom. Arrogance. Pride. Gluttony. Greed. Laziness. If you're lazy, I'm going to call you a sodomite. All right? And then, you know... Sodom and Gomorrah was judged, and I said the word Gomorrah, root word of gonorrhea. <laughs> if you're a Sodomite, you're going to get Gomorrah. <laughs> I made it up. <laughs> Just try to be funny. <laughs> All right, thank you, God. Let's give the Lord a hand.